Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, welcoming you in to this edition of Revealing the Truth with our dear friend and best-selling author, Carl Gallup. He's the author with Zev Perot of The Rabbi, The Secret Message, The Identity of Messiah, and the best-selling author of Gods of Ground Zero, Gods and Throne, Nahash, Forgotten Prophecy, and the return of the Elohim, when the lion roars, understand the implications of ancient prophecy for our times. Gods of the final kingdom and his latest book, Masquerade, prepare for the greatest con job in history. Carl is a senior pastor of Hickory Hammock Baptist Church in Milton, Florida since 1987, an Amazon top 60 best-selling author and a conservative talk radio host heard nationally and internationally and soon to be joining our iHeart Radio broadcast with us here on Igniting a Nation. You can find out more about him at carlgallops.com. He's here on the second Monday of every month at 12 o'clock hour for the Carl Gallops Hour. Uh, and also on this time, the uh, fourth Monday, is, I'm sorry, fourth Thursday of every month at the 11 o'clock hour for part two which is not tied to his books, but is our opportunity to enter into deep biblical theological discussion about the Bible. I want to welcome in my dear brother, Carl Gallops. Carl, so good to see you, my friend. It's great to be with you. Thank you so much, uh, my brother. I, listen, I, um, I, I enjoy our discussions and and uh, it, especially the deep theological ones. And so I'm looking forward to this today. And, and as you know, and I, and I know that you do the same thing. You write books, I write books. And the reason we write these books is so that we can engage in these kinds of discussions. And we save a lot of time because instead of having to explain and re-explain every time where we get our references from, where we get our sources from, to which scholars have we appealed, we can just say, look, go get my latest book, Masquerade. All of the references are there. Now that you know that, let me tell you what I've discovered. And so, you know, that's that's why we write these books. I just wanted to throw that in because sometimes people think when you're talking about your books all the time that you're trying to sell them. And I'm not a book salesman. I write them so that people can have the information and that when I make all these sensational claims, <laughs> they can go back and research and, and realize that I'm not just pulling this stuff out of my back pocket. There are a plethora of scholars who have seen the same kinds of things. You know, it's interesting. The other day I had uh, our good friend Mike Heiser on, as I do every month. And, yeah, he's and, a great uh, guy. I mean, it just uh, he's, a, he's an incredible friend. He's a peer of ours, along with Michael Lake, Daryl Gilbert, Rabbi Zeb Parat, uh, you know, people that you and I hang out with on a regular, uh, Derek yes. Gilbert, on a regular basis, we are always in communication uh, with each other, both here and in Israel. And it, one of the comments was made was, gee, that rabbi's a little long-winded. And we were talking about Mike's new book, Demons, but we had both agreed that the first segment was going to be foundational. Yes. It was not going to be about the book. It was going to be laying the foundation for the right interpretation of Scripture. Yes. And how and where the secondary text of the intertestamental period, that 400-year period, where we had the Dead Sea Scrolls, we had First Maccab and Second Maccabees, we had the Book of Jubilees, we had the Books of Enoch, we had some of the extra biblical text, which was contextual at the time and being read by and studied by <clears throat> Matthew and Mark and uh, Luke and John and Paul and the Pharisees and the people of the time, this was contemporary literature. <clears throat> and most people in the church are completely unfamiliar with the Essenes, the life at Qumran, what this was all about and what contribution they made. So we tend to uh, dive deep into the context of a book, but, but on most shows, but we don't do that here. We lay foundational stones. Uh, you know, when you build a building, the most boring part of the building is laying the foundation. The no, most important part. <laughs> right. And nobody stands around watching a high-rise building go up 
while they're looking down in a pit, seeing them driving, piling into the ground and pouring the concrete. concrete. Yeah. That's, that, that's just, you know, they have the walls with the holes in it, and you can look at uh, New York and big cities, you can see them. But nobody's gathered around for that. They're gathered around for when they put the big, you know, the guy's on the 24th floor, the 50th floor, and he's up there and he's putting up a piece of plate glass, and everybody's doing it on saying, I don't want to be that guy on the scaffold. And look at the guy with the crane that that, that piece of glass is swinging in the wind. But the most important part is, to most, the boring part. But for you and I, if we don't lay the foundation stones, we've got nothing to build on. And Jesus said, if you don't build your house on the rock, and you build it on the shifting sands, then the storm's going to come and knock it over. And you and I <clears throat> happen to be people that pick up the people that have been knocked over because yeah. they built their, found, their theological foundation on shifting sands. And in my 68 years of life, of Jewish life, uh, my, my foundation has never changed. I just have new information when I became a believer 24 years ago to add to the very rock solid foundation that was laid in my Hebrew, uh, natural Hebrew thinking mind. And so when you and I get together, Mike Heiser, Derek Gilbert, um, even with Zev, Zev and I are kind of like over here with the Jewish thought saying the one new man, when we pull all this together, it's really no different, but we come at it from a different uh, launch point. We start in Genesis 1. You've actually migrated and shifted over. Uh, we got you pulled over the line. We got Heiser pulled over the line. Uh, we got Gilbert pulled over the line. And uh, you're just as much of a Jewish thinker today as I am, having been only raised in the Jewish world. So <clears throat> that's a compliment to you. And to, you. and to those that have, have taken this gift and gone back and been provoked because understanding the gift requires you to, to believe that uh, and understand there was no New Testament at the time of Jesus. That's right. And Paul was being indoctrinated into the oral presentation of Peter and, and the world that he entered, he was hearing it preached. <clears throat> and that's why he's always referring back to what you've heard, not what you've read. Uh, and, right. and people miss that. It's a subtlety, but it's very different. And it's, it says, okay, if Jesus only did what he heard his father, what he saw his father do, and he only said what he heard his father say, we happen, happen to have the transcript of what his father said and what his father did. It should provoke every Christian to go back and read the Old Testament. Right. right. No, you're absolutely right. And you know, uh, yeah, I don't know when I came over that line. I know that probably it happened in seminary because I know ever since I've been at my church and I've been there 33 years, I have understood and I, I, and what I'm getting ready to say, I think, comes from my years in law enforcement and my years in criminal investigation. Two different sheriff's offices under three different sheriffs for almost 11 years. My mind thinks this way. Context. Things have to fit together. Things have to snap together like pieces of a puzzle. Um, you, you, you start at A, you wind up at Z only after you carefully put each piece in their proper place. Well, in seminary, it hit me. You cannot understand the New Testament unless you have read and thoroughly get the Old Testament. Now, you know, we're always still learning, so I'm not trying to say I understand everything in the New Testament perfectly. But what I'm saying is from Genesis to Malachi, I get the story. I get the connection. I see the connections of the prophecies, particularly the prophecies of the coming Christ, particularly the prophecies of the birth of the church, particularly the prophecies of the return of Israel, particularly the prophecies of the second coming of the Lord and the establishment of his kingdom on earth. All of that is in the Old Testament. So by the time we get to the New Testament, it all burst forth 
into life in the Word that became flesh in Jesus Christ, which is why John starts his gospel that way. Then when we read the New Testament, all of a sudden the seven feasts of the Lord jump off the pages and slap us in the face because we've been in the Old Testament and we understand that all the New Testament writers pointed to Jesus and said, he is the feast of Passover. He is the unleavened bread. He is the lamb that was slain before the fire. He is the first fruit from among the dead, etc., etc., etc. Then it all makes sense. And so that really enriched, I think, my preaching and teaching from 30 years ago. Now I've grown and matured. I've learned a whole lot more in those 30 years. I pray I have. But uh, thank you for the compliment. I, I receive it as a compliment. I've had so many messianics like yourself and Zev tell me, you must have a little bit of Hebrew blood in you because you see things that most Baptist preachers don't see. Well, I, I don't know about that. I'm sure there are other guys out there like you and me that see it. But there seem to be few of us. <laughs> it does seem that because a lot of times when I'm talking to my fellow pastors about all these connections, they look at me like a deer caught in the headlights, you know, it's like... So I don't know, but but again, all praise to Jesus if he has shown us these things. But you're right, uh, you, you, you can't understand the richness of the Old Testament unless you've had a personal walk with Jesus through the New Testament and been born again. And you cannot, and then that's where a lot of Orthodox Jews are. They, they understand the Old Testament, but they're not born again. They do not have a personal walk with Jesus. So the richness of the Old Testament hasn't burst forth in their soul yet. Uh, but a lot of Christians, on the other hand, they have a personal walk with Jesus. They claim to be born again. And I'm not judging them. I'm just saying, you know, a lot of people claim it. But but those that do, but they have not been connected to the Old Testament. In fact, a lot of them have been purposely disconnected uh, from the Old Testament. And they're missing out on 80 percent of the richness of what their faith is really all about and how stupendous it is that they can say, I am born again by the blood of Jesus Christ. Well, that's powerful, but once you understand that that was planned before the foundation of the earth, and it was prophesied down through the ages, every detail of it, and that God brought it to life just for your salvation, then it's a whole different world. And so anyway, you're, you, you're absolutely right. You just said something very powerful. The term born again comes from Rabbi Nicodemus's yes. under darkness, cloak of darkness visit with Jesus. Yes. So this has become a very common Christian term. So has sealed by the blood of the Lamb. Yes. Neither one of those terms existed outside of Judaism. And Jesus <clears throat> never op operated outside of Judaism. Correct. So these are not Christian birth. This is in the lexicon. And if you go back and say, well, what is the first usage of this expression? The first usage is not in the New Testament. The concept of being born again, we see several times. The earth was born again out of the water. It broke through the water. It, 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 was, a, it was a physical birth, but we also have <clears throat> the spiritual birth. We see that when Jesus came up out of the water, this was a new birth for him. He was now cleansed of the world, and this is the first time that the Lord declared publicly, this is my son, in whom I'm well pleased. And that established once and for all his identity and launched his ministry after that 40 days of being taken out into the desert, into, into the, to, to the temptation. Wilderness, yeah. Uh, it, it, it's interesting that we've hijacked so much of it and made it Christian when it's really a Jewish concept. Sealed by the blood of the Lamb, is directly from Exodus chapter 12. Even Gentile converts, when they were brought into Judaism, they were baptized, and there was a, there was a connotation of you're now being born again. You yes. are now coming into the faith of Yahweh, and now you are one of us. You may not have been born a Hebrew, but by the 
grace of God over you and your new birth, you are now a Hebrew. I mean, that, that's ancient. That goes all the way back. All the way back. So the mikvah, tevila, the full water immersion, and it was always, and, and you and I are both ordained Baptist ministers. Okay? I'm an ordained rabbi, but also an ordained Baptist minister. Dare, dare we admit that, <clears throat> brother? Dare we admit that? Yeah, well, you know, I was, <laughs> I was once asked, does that mean you're a Calvinist? And I said, no, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a Levi. And they said, <laughs> Levi? I said, yeah, Calvin's too tight in the seat and I just can't wear them. And yeah. they said, what are you talking about? I said, aren't you talking about Calvin Klein? And yeah. they, said, they said, no, 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 we're talking about John Calvin. I said, yes. I, yeah. I, I never met the man. You didn't know. Yeah, people often describe me as a Baptocostal Messianic Hebrew pastor. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Pentecostal, charismatic, spirit-filled Jew is the same way that I describe myself. Yeah, yeah, but anyway, go ahead. You were saying we're both ordained Baptist ministers when I so rudely interrupted you. Right, and, and uh, it's traditional, and you probably have one in your church, uh, uh, baptismal. Yes. Now, the definition of tevila is full water immersion in a moving body of water not in a stagnant body of water because when you, what you take into that grave is washed away. Right. I want you to think about this for a minute. Why does it need to be washed away? Well, we do it in the Jordan River in Israel because that's the natural place because it flows into the Dead Sea. We do it uh, at the outflow of the Sea of Galilee, not the inflow, not the headwaters. It's always at the uh, portion, the southern portion, which is going into the Dead Sea, where there is no life. So it's washed from you, it's taken to a watery grave, washed away. Well, if I go into the traditional baptismal, I only want to be the first person in. I don't want to be the 16th person in, because whatever those first 15 people left in the watery grave, I'm now going into there, and I'm thinking to myself, I will never go into that hot tub or whatever it is that they have in place as the second person because whatever they left behind <laughs> is still there. It's like, I mean, th think about it. That's why the definition of a mikvah is that it has to have an inflow and an outflow because you're washing the uncleanness. Yes. You're, yes. Wa you're just not, you're not burying it. Right? Yes. That means like you have this whole pile of dirt at the bottom of the baptismal. As soon as my feet hit it, it swirls it up into the water. Yes. I'm being washed with, washed with dirty water. The reason I would never, have never gotten in a hot tub with anybody other than my wife. If somebody else said, let me join you, then I'm out of there. <laughs> so when I, say, when I say this, and I want to clarify this, neither have I, and that does not mean that it was with your wife. Yes, yes. I so I want to be very careful to, 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 to qualify. Yes. When I introduced Mike Heiser the other day, it, it was a, a total slip of the tongue. And, and you know, I, I try to keep my show intro uh, the same each time for consistency purposes. So I use a prompter over here to do the intro. And I forgot to put Naked Bible Podcast on there. And when I presented it, I said, you can find them at uh, drmsh.com and the Naked Podcast. And, <laughs> and uh, he, he, just, he, just, he just rolled over laughing. And he, he said, well, I, I hate to start off the show correcting you, but it is not the Naked <laughs> Podcast with Dr. Mike Heiser. I am fully clothed. It is the <laughs> Naked Bible podcast. You say, Michael Heiser, I love him dearly. I count him as a good friend, but he brought that on himself by naming his podcast The Naked. <laughs> Anytime you put the word naked in something, uh, you, you take a chance. <laughs> you know, spe speaking of Mike, speaking of Derek, speaking of Zev, speaking of uh, uh, Michael Lake, uh, the, those we consider um, uh, really our, our, our peer group, but also our uh, trusted uh, friends, uh, yes. the ones that you and I both have complete transparency with. We've, we have talked about things that are 
Uh, it says if you can count on one hand your trusted friends, that, uh, that's, that's the hand I count on. You're right. Um, Me too. And, and we, I, in fact, I have a finger or two left over sometimes. <laughs> um, the um, one thing that we all talk about a lot, and it comes up in conversations a lot, is Paul's letters and uh, the rightful interpretation of Paul's letters. Yeah. Um, Mike gave the example. He said he had a, uh, a professor that came in uh, up here when he was, was on staff uh, teaching seminary who um, came and did an expository teaching on a letter that he received from his mother. And he came in and he dissected it, every word, every word pairing, and, and did an, uh, an exegesis and a uh, hermeneutics on a letter from his mother. Yes. And uh, Mike said it was one of the greatest object lessons he had ever had because that's what we tend to do with parsing out the letters from Paul without looking at the context of what was going on in the Thank environment. You. Thank um, you. And we create this doctrine out of a letter from your mother is, right. is, is, is virtually. And uh, my statement has been is that as we examine these letters, if you are not exhibiting this same behavior that they were exhibiting in Philippi or in uh, Ephesus or in um, Thessalonica, uh, then this is not a standard blanket. It has to do with a particular set of behaviors yes. and a particular set of, and, and he had this pastoral apostolic heart where his letters were always very comforting because he knew of the persecution of the body of faith that was evolving as they became more entrenched in this uh, anti-Rome, uh, anti-Roman Catholic, uh, this influence of, of Rome's heavy hand against what was first and second century Judaism, that they were, they were being persecuted for. And how do you blend and mold and, and take a group of people that had no foundation in the scriptures, introduce them to the scriptures, and position the scriptures in a way that this is not a binding law uh, this is a rule for life. Uh, Deuteronomy was never meant to be the book of the law. It was to be the book of choices and instruction for exactly what Matthew 5 is built upon that Jesus quotes from in the Sermon on the Mount. He quoted to Satan uh, in those 40 days. It is to give us this foundation that really is a summation of the entirety of the first four books and then of the launch pad to all other pathways of, yes. of walking along the way, yes. referred to in yes. Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 9. And then that's why Jesus says, I am the way. This is a direct linkage to Deuteronomy 6, 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your strength. And these words which I command you today are to be on your heart. And you're to yes. teach them to your children when you rise up and when you lie down and when you walk along the way. Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. The uh, uh, Haderic, the way. Uh, emet, the life. Uh, the truth. I'm sorry, Ha Emet, the truth. And uh, ha Chaim, uh, the life. Chaim, yeah. yeah. So he, he's making this declaration in a very profound way that, that shook up the Pharisees, of course, but, but he's clearly telling us this. So as Paul, who's raised up in the, the, Torah, the Torah and the Tanakh, um, is writing letters of comfort He's also drawing on what um, was given to us in uh, the book of Daniel, what was given to us in the book of Ezekiel, what was given to us to the prophet Isaiah. All of these things are part of the foundational truths 
of Paul's upbringing, seasoned now with understanding the fulfillment of the Psalms, the fulfillment of all the Messianic prophecies, all wrapped up, and that's why he was blinded, because God literally shut his eyes to give him into darkness, that fulfilling of that prophecy in Isaiah, you have eyes to see but will not be seen, you have ears to hear but will not perceive. This is now what was done when his eyes were opened, he could now see. When he could now have all his senses operating, he could now perceive, and he now had his Damascus Road experience and his coming to faith he didn't throw out, and nowhere did God ever say to throw out. As a matter of fact, he says in Jeremiah 31, 31, he said, uh, Behold, I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It won't be like the old covenant written on tablets of stone. I will write my law. He doesn't say a new law. And, th and this is where we get really confused because we say, well, no, this is the new covenant in Jesus. But in, in, the, in the Acts chapter 2, when he writes, finally writes the law and puts it in their minds and it will be in their hearts and no longer will they have to teach a brother, a brother to know the Lord because they will all know him from the least to the greatest. He didn't write some new law. He says, I will write my law. And so everything has to go back to a continuity, a contiguous unbroken chain which we cannot come and contemporize and break the chain and say well this is 2020 it doesn't mean that anymore we have to say this is 2020 and this is how this applies to today yeah and we have to say this is 2020 and we have 2000 years of the understanding of how these things are fulfilled in Jesus Christ and what the context to all of that is. And so you're right. I mean, th there is a foundation, there's a context, and, uh, and, and what, what, what people want to do is to compartmentalize. Well, I believe this, but I don't believe this. Or, you know, this fits here, but it doesn't fit here. No, it all fits together. And, uh, and there's a context to it all, an eschatological context, a hermeneutical context, an exegetical context, <laughs> a historical context, a linguistic context. And so, you know, it, it takes some study, which is why the scriptures tell us, look, study to show yourself approved, a workman able to accurately handle the word of truth. It's not meant as a little children's fairy tale book. It's not meant as a magic book of spells and incantations. It's the living word of God, and you have to live in it. You have to live it. You have to walk with the hand of Jesus and live through it by the Holy Spirit, illuminating the connection of the scriptures and the context. And then you come out on the other end saying, the, the scales have been lifted. I yep. get it now. And that's what happened to Paul. That's exactly what happened to Paul. We're talking with Carl Gallup's author of a new book, Masquerade, but uh, we're really drawing on his theological understanding as a uh, theologian, as a minister of the gospel, of one who has studied this text. And uh, this discussion today has laid the foundation, the first part, for foundational truth. Uh, again, like we did with Dr. Mike Heiser, we're laying a foundation so that when we return from break and we're going to dig into 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and talk in detail about Paul was, what Paul was actually saying and what he was referring to that has been uh, sensationalized. Yes, it misunderstood, is, it, 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 misinterpreted, mis, <laughs> mis, misapplied, misapplied, and, yes. um, and leading people to believing yeah. uh, that one thing and, when it should have been another. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and it, this, it, this, this is going to sound very cavalier, <clears throat> and uh, I apologize <clears throat> to our audience who thinks it's cavalier and uh, disrespectful, and I mean no disrespect by it. I'm going to tell you an honest Jewish man's recipient of this invitation 
of accepting Jesus as Messiah. And in the way we've presented <clears throat> the text of this letter, in our presentation of the gospel, is that it is almost a dual salvation message. And what, am I, what do I mean by that? Today, if you accept Jesus as your Messiah, you will have eternal life, but wait, there's more. Operators are standing by. If you accept Jesus today, we're going to throw in not only eternal life and salvation, but we're going to throw in a get out of the coming tribulation before it happens. You're going to get a special ticket. That To me, that's a dual salvation theology. Yeah. You've opened a can of worms, but I'm glad to talk with you about it. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, that's no, I, I agree with you. I do. And you know that. But, uh, yeah. Uh, but, but that, that and, and, and as a young Jewish believer, when I began to, to study and hear in the New Testament and listen to teachings on this, I couldn't help but in my spirit feel that way that you're offering a buy one, get one free. Yeah. In this presentation. And that is maybe a jaundiced eye view of what we're going to talk about, but it's from my heart and telling you what it sounded like to me as a Jew listening to this presentation that uh, this is something that is antithetical to Jesus' statement that says, if you follow me, there will be tribulation. Yeah. Not maybe, but there will be. We're going to yeah. take a short break and we'll be right back. The Lord meets you right where you are, and so does Igniting Nation's new live streaming outlets. You can now watch Revealing the Truth, Revealing the Bible, and Prophecy Revealed simulcast live each Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 1 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on YouTube Live, Facebook Live, Vimeo, Periscope, and through our website, www.ignitinganation.com. No matter what device you are using, our program will automatically scale so you won't have to miss a single program. And if you happen to miss an episode, you can always subscribe to the Igniting a Nation YouTube channel and access over 1,000 interviews and never miss your favorite authors, special guests, and topics that interest you the most. There are lots of ways to see Israel, but nothing compares to seeing the land of the book and the people of the book through the eyes of two Jewish believers who can take you on a journey that will bring the entire Bible to life. When you join Rabbi Eric Walker and his number one rated tour guide, Edo Canaan in Israel, you'll experience incredible teachings, first class accommodations, and actually walk where Jesus walked. You will experience the Bible transforming from black and white into living color, and you will never see the Bible in the same way again. For more information, visit us at www.ignitinganation.com forward slash events. The Lord contends with what contends with you, and Igniting a Nation is committed to bringing to light each and every issue that faces a believer's life. Our live stream programming and teachings take you on a journey to finding biblical truth from a wide variety of experts who share their insights into a deeper walk with the Lord. We have assembled the most comprehensive panel of experts in the fields of prophecy, caregiving, healing from trauma, shame and abuse, and so much more. We continue to expand our teachings and programming to meet your needs. We're committed to healing the nations with biblical truth. Visit www.ignitinganation.com to develop a deeper walk with the Lord and start your journey to a transformed life. The Bible commands us to study to show ourselves approved, but most study using Bible study tools and not actually studying the Bible chapter and verse. Igniting a Nation is pleased to present Revealing the Bible, recorded and taught each week before a live audience. We take you deeper into the actual Bible and verse in both Hebrew and English and connect the dots between the Old and New Testament. You can attend our two classes in Tuscaloosa and Birmingham or watch the program every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Central Time on IgnitingAnation.com and all our other simulcast outlets. For more information, visit www.
www.ignitingnation.com forward slash events. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker. We're talking with Carl Gallops, author of the new book, Masquerade, and the pastor of Hickory Hammock Baptist Church. Carl, welcome back to the second edition of Carl the Carl Gallops Hour. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's good to be here. It's an honor. Thanks. Thank you. I want to toss this right back into your court. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Little brief history. What was going on in Thessalonica that caused Paul to want to address to them a compassionate letter uh, that was the purpose was not for him to build or make a calendar, but for him to build character. Yes. That, yes, that was it, the message. Matter of fact, he was kind of speaking against calendars. Uh, and, and, and he told the church, he said, listen, I, I should really have no need to tell you this. He said, because I've written about this before. I've preached about this before. Do you not remember what I have preached to you? Do you not remember what I have written to you? But I find it necessary, and I'm paraphrasing. He yes. says, but I find it necessary to go over this with you again, because certain false teachers have come among you making you believe that the day of the Lord has already come somehow and, you know, dates and times and maybe they miss some special blessing they should have gotten. Or, and, and, and he says, let me just set this straight again. And you can almost hear his frustration. Right. And as a th pastor for three decades in one church, I get Paul's frustration <laughs> because how many times have I preached through entire doctrinal series and then 10 years later, people, I don't understand. How come you don't ever preach on this? I said, I've preached on it for months, you know, or I'll preach it. And they'll say, preacher, I've, I've never heard that before. I've, I, <laughs> that's the most amazing thing I've ever heard. And I said, oh my gosh. So people are just prone to that. And I guess Paul, you know, and now people were being led astray by false teachers trying to cash in on the new economic boom, you know, the church and thousands and thousands of people from all over the empire coming into the church. And, and you know, evil people saw a ripe crowd, a ripe tree for the picking. And so they were coming in with all their fancy teachings and visions of angels and all of this stuff. And Paul sat them down in Thessalonica. And, and eventually these letters circulated to all the churches. They were so overwhelming and powerful and anointed by the Holy Spirit. But he sat them down in Thessalonica and said, I shouldn't have to tell you this again, but sit down and listen to me. I have told you this before. Here's how it happens. Here is how it's going to happen. Now, before we go into the details of what we're talking about, let me remind the listeners, we've got to remember this is the same Paul that had been caught up to paradise and had seen the time of the end 30 years before John was caught up at Patmos. 30 years. See, Paul died in 67 AD. John wasn't caught up to, the, uh, to receive the book of Revelation, most scholars believe, and until the 90s AD. So 30 years earlier, Paul had already been caught up to paradise. And by the way, it's Paul who preaches and teaches about the Lord's return, uh, with what body shall the holy ones come when they come, uh, the last trumpet, we will all be transformed, the rapture, the trumpets, the, uh, uh, the return of the Lord, the Antichrist, uh, the man of lawlessness, truth being thrown. See, Paul saw everything that John saw in Revelation, but Paul admitted. He said, I wasn't permitted to tell it all because God was going to use John for that 30 years later, but he did use Paul to build the foundation for the church so that when Revelation came along, there would be a foundation laid. And my gosh, Revelation, with the books of Paul, they fit together like a hand and glove. Mm -hmm. And, and so, so a lot of people forget that context. And they forget those details. So when Paul comes along in the, the, the two books of, to, the, uh, to the Thessalonians, uh, particularly uh, the second Thessalonians where we're going to go today, and particularly chapter 2, because that's where he gets into the man of lawlessness, truth being thrown to the ground, um, uh, setting himself up in the temple of God and claiming to be God. And I mean, that's pretty powerful stuff. Uh, but there's a context to it. 
there's a linguistic context. He's very careful of the Greek words that he chooses. And, and they have corresponding Hebrew words, too, by the way. But we're going to deal with the Greek today because that's where they come from. But Zev Parat, uh, you know, who speaks Hebrew as his very first and mother tongue, that's the only language he knew for most of his life, uh, he, he, he has affirmed to me everything that I have discovered, well, the Holy Spirit has shown me over decades and decades, and he has confirmed to me not only the corresponding Hebrew words, but the nuances of those words and how they're used even today in modern Hebrew. Uh, uh, when, when modern Hebrew people speak of these words that you and I are going to talk about in a moment, he says, yes, they use them the very same way that you're talking about. There are the differences in these Greek words. Paul uses very specific Greek words that have Hebrew correspondence. And as like you and I believe, he probably spoke in Hebrew. He might have even originally written in Hebrew and then, you know but but the bottom line is when we come to second Thessalonians so much of the relatively modern church of the last 150 years has missed the the truth of this and I again I, I this is why I write my books you know and I know that sounds like I have a little hubris to say they've missed it and I've got it no 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 now, a lot of scholars have gotten what you and I see here it's just that this overwhelming doctrine this overwhelming theology of the last 150 years that has swept the Western Christian Church because I think it was a, a, a gospel of fluffiness a gospel of convenience you know so much is gonna happen that we won't even be here for and I pray they're right, and I pray I'm wrong. But the problem is that's not what Second Thessalonians chapter 2 says, not only in the original language, but in the context of what he's been talking about through all of his letters. And then when he arrives at Second Thessalonians, he, he says to them, I shouldn't have to tell you this. I've already written about this. Oh, wow. Where did he write it? Well, we have the documents. So if we will go back, we can see exactly what he was talking about. All right, so I've spoken in almost code. Now do you want me to get to the, to the, to the heart of it? Okay, okay, you're saying yes? Okay, all right, good. Uh, yeah, well, here's the heart of it. I'm speaking specifically right now, and we could do three hours of show on this, and I'm not going to. Let me just remind the listeners, this is where I... <laughs> plug my book masquerade again because because I'm going to save time. I'm going to say a lot of things as though I just know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and, and and people are listening. So well, where did he get that? Where does he reference that? It's all in my book masquerade. Okay. But to save time, I'm just going to tell you the result of all of my decades of study. And it's all there. Dozens and dozens and dozens of reliable, renowned scholars see the same stuff. They agree with it. Doesn't make me right. Doesn't make them right. But it does mean I'm not crazy. I'm not pulling this out of thin air. It's backed by word studies. Plus, I went to Zev, making sure that I was understanding the Hebrew concept and the Hebrew words correctly as they were used in biblical times as well as how they are used today. So here we go. So I'm speaking specifically in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 of when the Apostle Paul says, and the man of lawlessness, again, I'm paraphrasing. I don't have these right in front of my face, but I was immersed in them so long. I, I feel like I could rewrite the book of 2 Thessalonians by hand if I had to. But, but he says, look, with this man of lawlessness, when he, is, when he is just really working in the world and throwing truth to the ground. Well, brother, we live in the day of fake news, right? Fake everything. Truth is thrown to the ground daily, not ad nauseum in front of us. He says when these things are happening, he said that's when this man of lawlessness and the system that he represents will eventually set himself up in God's temple. And some translations say in the temple of God. So it depends on the translation, but both are correct, of course. There's just a little nuance of word difference there. In the temple of God or in God's temple. He sets himself up in the temple of God or in God's temple and claims that he himself is God. Yes. Well, when you take into what Daniel said about the ceasing of the sacrifices, well, who's Daniel writing about? Well, he's writing about the end times. Well, in the end times, there is no Jewish temple, 
So there are no sacrifices. So people say, well, that means he must be going to be built a, a new temple and all that. And that's another whole teaching. But, but what if Daniel was speaking of, Paul speaks about what the sacrifices of God's people are in the last days? Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. This is Paul, same Paul that wrote Second Thessalonians. And, 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 and be not conformed to this world, but, but transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do not, do, you know, the sacrifices. Who are God's people in the last days? Well, we can loosely say the Hebrew Jewish people in that they are the ones through whom God has worked through. But, but, but truly, the only people that have the right to be called the sons of God in the last days are those who believed upon Jesus Christ, John chapter 1. And to those who believed upon him, to them he gave the right to be called the sons of God. So are there Jews who are now sons of God? Absolutely. Are there Gentiles who are sons of God? Absolutely. Hebrews chapter 2 and chapter, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 2 and chapter 3 speaks of the one new man. Correct. And what does Paul say there? And this Jew that's under the blood of Jesus, this Gentile that's under the blood of Jesus, together they're being joined together and built up into the new temple into the new temple of God. What? Oh, yes. And throughout Paul's writings, he says to the Christians personally and collectively, do you not know? Don't you understand that you are the temple of God? Don't you understand that you, the church, are God's temple? Over and over and over, he uses that phrase, which is why I think he comes in exasperation to Second Thessalonians, and he says, I shouldn't have to tell you this. I've written this down in black and white. I've preached it. I've stood before you. You've read my other writings, my other letters. And so when I'm telling you that there is going to be a spirit of lawlessness that's going to permeate even the church and even the heart of people who call themselves believers— this, this spirit, and eventually this man, and eventually the system that he runs, will set himself up over the temple of God, or try to set himself up in the heart of God's people. He will claim that he is God. He has authority to tell you what to do, when you can worship, how you can worship, what you can sacrifice, how you sacrifice it. Brother, it's so clear when you understand it. Now, I'm going to get into a modern-day example because we're living in the edges of the fulfillment of that prophecy right now. I, and I'm going to prove this in just a second. Now, I'm not saying that Second Thessalonians chapter 2 is exactly what we're living. I'm not saying we're in the final days of the Great Tribulation. I'm not saying that. I'm saying before God brings his ultimate revelations upon the earth, he almost always brings foreshadowings and types, especially among his people of the days in which it's getting ready to happen. And he brings warnings, he brings images, he brings metaphors, he brings parables, he brings foreshadowings, so that God's people are not caught like thieves in the night. And so we, that's the stage we're in right now, brother. We're watching some things happen that have never happened to the church in 2,000 years before. Never. There is a spirit of truth being thrown to the ground. There's a spirit of, the, of lawlessness that's telling the church what to do. You cannot gather in churches. You will become a killing field. You can go to Walmart. You can go to Sam's Club. You can go to Lowe's, you can go to Home Depot, you can buy azaleas, you can buy golf clubs and fishing poles and, and croquet sets and swimming gear and fishing gear, but you cannot go to church or we will put you in jail or we will fine you. You cannot do that. that that's the very spirit Paul was talking about. I can prove it from the language and I'm going to, and it's what he says throughout the scriptures. We're, we're the first generation to ever step over that line where we watch the whole globe is under the spirit of fear and panic over what? A pandemic, a virus, a disease, an epidemic that has caused even Christians, and I'm going to say so-called, and I'm not judging anybody's faith or salvation. I'm just saying we don't know. A lot of people call themselves Christians. A lot of people say, Lord, Lord. 
But Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, but in that day, I will say to a bunch of those that run around calling me, Lord, Lord, hey, you depart from me. I didn't know you. You didn't know me. Yeah, but weren't we in church in your name? Didn't we give money in your name? We even participated in, in miracle services in your name. He said, yeah, but you didn't know me, and I didn't know you. You called me, Lord, Lord, but I didn't know you. So that's why I'm saying even now we are living in a time where we're watching so-called Christians and pastors um, turn other pastors in and turn against other Christians and, 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 and call the law on other churches and Christians. And Jesus said, look, in these days, brother will turn against brother, sister against sister, parents against children, children against parents. They will turn each other into the authorities. Paul, Jesus says that. So we're living in a microcosm. We've stepped over the threshold. Never has the church woken up on a Resurrection Sunday, Passover week, and couldn't find a place to go to church anywhere in the world. Now, a few exceptions, like my little church stayed open the whole time, and a few little scatterings of that around the world. But 95, 98% of the church around the world wasn't even open this Resurrection Sunday for the first time since the birth of the church. That's never happened before, brother. That's never happened, not across the whole globe. What's happening? Well, Satan has been thrown down. He knows his time is short. He is filled with rage. He's lashing out. The resurrection is his death nail. The celebration of it in the midst of him getting ready to bring <clears throat> his kingdom, his Antichrist kingdom, is a, is, a, is a spit in his face. He is furious. He's working through disease and death and fear and panic. To, to get to set himself up even over God's temple. Paul says over and over, don't you know that you are the temple of God? Don't you know the church is the temple of God? Don't you know that Jew and Gentile under the blood of Jesus are being built into the new temple? Don't you know this? Even Jesus himself said, look, tear this temple down. And he was pointing to the one in Jerusalem. And he says, I'll build a temple back in three days. Well, the Bible says he was talking of his own body. Well, what is the church called? The body of Christ. Well, I'm going to stop you there because it says that he was talking about his own body, but it's in parentheses. Yes. It is not exactly in the text. It's parenthetical. Now, I will give you, as we close out this segment because we're running out of time, I'm going to give you a different perspective on the three days, and we're going to close. And I'm going to let you stew on it until I see you again. Okay. All right, yeah, and that's my fault. I spoke okay, too much, that, but that, I didn't that, even get into okay, the study of the, right. of the words. All right, yeah. but um, he only said there's going to be one sign that was the sign of Jonah. Okay, I'll only give you one sign. The extra statement of tear this temple down and I will rebuild it in three days was not a sign. All right, it was a prophetic word. Sure it was. The, those three days in my humble Jewish opinion, will be the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Feast of Trumpets becomes the last trumpet call. Day of Atonement, salvation comes to Israel when all of Israel saves and is atoned for. And the Feast of Tabernacles, the day we celebrate dwelling with the presence of the King. Those to me were the sign of the three days from a Jewish man's thought, the fall feast of the Moedim of Leviticus 23. It's a very astute and biblically contextual observation. And like I tell folks, with any prophetic utterance, particularly about the last days, there's almost always at least two veins of fulfillment, sometimes three veins. I think you've hit on a beautiful golden vein of fulfillment. Uh, and, and I think there is at least one other, maybe three, but they don't, they don't negate each other. They no. all flow together. They do. But you've hit, you've hit on a beautiful vein. Yeah. Yeah. That's we'll, wonderful. We'll, we'll, we'll talk yeah. about that more because it's a, it's a yeah. fascinating perspective. There are also, I have a perspective on the catching up. Yeah. All right. Which is yeah. very unique. It ties back to <clears throat> the earthquake, which causes the renovation of the earth that based on the seismologists, no living life, no man can live and survive the global impact of that earthquake yeah. that splits the mountain in two. So, 
if there is life on earth, what happens to the people that live on the earth? The only way that they could possibly continue to live is if they were caught up in the clouds while the renovation of the earth was taking place and then they were brought back down to a renovated earth that happened to be the reunification of the three continents mentioned in the Bible. Because there's only three, Asia, Africa, and Europe. Does that mean North and South America get pushed back to where they came from? I say yes. Could very I well say, be. I say the renovation of the earth. We're out of time. We've got to go. You leave them let with me, leave them with let one. Let me beg. Let me finish when we come back because people are going to call me heretic since oh, I didn't get oh, finished. Absolutely. Please let me finish. A absolutely. We will do this in two <laughs> weeks. Thanks. Next time I see you. God bless you, my friend. I love you. I mean it. Love to Pamela, and I'll see Brandon in a couple weeks as well. All right. Okay. God bless you, my friend. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.